Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Claire Urbanski and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here on occupied Ohlone lands at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University. I'm very excited to welcome you to today's Clayman Conversations event, Why Indigenous Land Back is a Feminist Issue. We are incredibly fortunate to be joined by today's panel of acclaimed and brilliant activists, scholars, and community leaders, each of whom has deeply transformed, shaped, and inspired my own praxis. In the event that you are new to the Clayman Institute, since 1974, the Institute has been conducting research around topics related to feminism, gender, race, and sexuality, and has brought together communities of interdisciplinary scholars. The Clayman has made it our mission to translate gender research to broad audiences. For more information about our fellowships, internship opportunities, events, and research, please visit our website at gender.stanford.edu. As we get started, I must first acknowledge the land that we are on. And for those of us here at Stanford, we are on stolen, occupied, indigenous Ohlone lands, and many of us are complicit in this fact in many different ways. To acknowledge the land is to acknowledge our relationalities to and with land, and means that we must ask ourselves, what are our responsibilities to the land that we are on? What are we doing to alleviate the forms of extraction, dispossession, displacement, and harm that powerful universities enact? Without meaningful, material, transformative action, we remain complicit, and such land acknowledgements are merely performative acts. It is with the aim of inciting such action that today's event takes up the focus of land back, the return of indigenous lands to indigenous stewardship. The ongoing dispossession of indigenous lands is required in order for the United States and other settler colonial nations and societies to exist where an indigenous dispossession must be reinforced and reproduced each day. Such dispossession has required the ongoing enforcement of colonial heteropatriarchal sex and gender systems and the deployment of unrelenting violence against particularly indigenous women, girls, queer, trans, and two-spirit peoples. Therefore, as all of today's speakers have taught me, to return indigenous lands is not merely the material transfer of property from one set of hands to another, but is rather a practice and process of radical transformation. It is the restoration of sacred relationships. It is the cultivation of otherwise ways of life and otherwise possibilities for life beyond the world wrought by colonial capitalism. Before I hand things over to our moderator, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for today's event, the Bill Lane Center for the American West, the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, the Office of Postdoctoral Affairs, the Program in American Studies, the Program in Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies, the Office of Student Affairs, the Stanford Humanities Center, and especially thank you to the Stanford Native American Graduate Students Group for their generous support and feedback. As this is a Zoom webinar, please note that you will need to submit your questions via the Q&A function. It is being live captioned right now and it is also being recorded. We will post the video to our YouTube channel in the coming days and we will also be emailing out a list of links to relevant resources, books and articles, uh, which we will email out in the next few days. I'd now like to introduce our esteemed moderator who will be guiding us through today's discussion. Dr. Caitlin or Katie Kilia, Assistant Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Cruz, is an indigenous feminist historian specializing in 20th century native experiences in the West. Her scholarship engages Indian labor exploitation, dispossession and surveillance of native bodies, especially in native Californian contexts. Her forthcoming book examines how native women domestic workers negotiated and challenged an early 20th century Indian labor program based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Kalia is Yarrington Paiute and Washoe, and her tribal communities inform her scholarship. Welcome, Dr. Kalia. Thank you so much, Claire, for that very warm introduction. And I really appreciate you bringing us all together today. Uh, go slugs. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our panel today. I am so thrilled to moderate this panel. I think this is a very uh, important and timely discussion. Uh, as a reminder, our event today is going to be recorded. So if you were wondering, it will be on the YouTube uh, for the Claimant Institute later. 
And again, we will save some time towards the end for a Q&A, but if you have some questions, feel free. You can start putting those in the Q&A um, chat feature here on Zoom. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our wonderful panelists. Um, Laura Harjo is a Muscogee Creek Scholar, award-winning author, indigenous planner, and teacher. She's an associate professor and the previous interim chair in Native American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. She is a distinguished visiting fellow in Native American and Indigenous Studies at Emory University. Harjo's book, Spiral to the, St to the Stars, Muskogee Tools of Futurity, employs Muskogee epistemologies and Indigenous feminisms to offer a community-based practice of futurity. Her book won the 2020 Beatrice Medicine Award for Best Published Monograph and the 2021 On the Brink Book Award and Lecture. Welcome, Laura. Next up, we have Kutcha Risling Baldi. Kutcha is an associate professor of Native American studies at Cal Poly Humboldt. Her research engages indigenous feminisms, California Indians, environmental justice, indigenous natural resource management, mental health and cultural interventions and decolonization. She is the co-director of the NAS Food Sovereignty Lab and Traditional Ecological Knowledges Institute. Her book, We Are Dancing for You, Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies received Best First Book at the 2019 Native American and Indigenous Studies Association Conference. She is Hoopa, Karuk, and Yurok, and enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe. Welcome, Kutcha. Karina Gould is the tribal chair for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn Nation. She was born and raised in the village of Huchin, now known as Oakland, California. She is the co-founder and lead organizer for Indian People Organizing for Change, a small native-run organization, and the Segorite Land Trust, an urban indigenous women-led organization within her ancestral territory. Through the practices of rematriation, cultural revitalization, and land restoration, the Land Trust calls on native and non-native peoples to heal and transform legacies of colonization and genocide, and to do the work our ancestors and future generations are calling us to do. Welcome, Karina. And as we begin today, I want to start with a couple of scaffolding questions. Sort of the first one is, why does land back even exist, right? Uh, and it starts with dispossession. So here in California, we had three major waves of colonization that ultimately get us to where we are today. First, we have the Spanish, then the Mexican, and ultimately the U.S. regimes. Over the span of hundreds of years, native land tenure and ownership was either precarious or simply non-existent. Can you give us a context for native land dispossession in your own communities and explain that to our audience? Um, I will pass it to Karina first, if you mind uh, answering that question for us. I thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful to be here with everybody today. Um, that's, a, that's a hardball question to start off with, I think. Uh, but thank you so much, Katie, for that um, conversation piece to start with. You know, I think when we talk about land bought back and what does it mean for our communities and how does that, uh, we have to look at the disposition of what happened to us in our tribal territories. And, you know, the Spanish took our, as you said, there was these waves of genocide and these waves of dispossession that happened over time. But today, if we just take it back just to today, right? And today we look at our tribal members who um, are a very small tribe, you know, we are, our numbers are just under 300 people and uh, our tribal members are all over the country. We have folks that are in Florida and different parts, but why is it? Why aren't people living at home? We just take, we, uh, our tribal territory encompasses five Bay Area counties, um, Alameda, Contra Costa, San Joaquin and parts of Napa and Solano. Um, and of all of that land, our, ants, our people today um, own almost nothing. But if you just take it to Alameda County, right, one county, 425,000 square miles of land. Um, up until a few years ago, there were no Ohlone people that owned anything. So to be homeless in your own homeland, to still be living in your tribal territories, to have not had a, uh, a, a direct disconnection from your land, but to have nowhere to pray, have nowhere to gather, to have no place to re-enter your ancestor remains, to have no place that you can call a place of your own. 
when you have to ask permission from uh, folks that are private landowners or park districts uh, for a place to have ceremony, to have a disposition in a different kind of a way, not just from the land, but from a spiritual aspect, a way for us not to be who we are as human beings on our own territory. And so I think that um, I'll leave it at that for me. Katja or Laura, would you like to take that question? Um, yeah, sure, I can, can give us a sort of mini response. Um, so I, I'm fortunate enough to live in the uh, areas and homelands where a lot of the peoples that I come from, so I'm Hoopa Valley tribal member, I'm also York and Karuk, um, where we live, where we, where we have done ceremony since the beginning of time. And I think living in a region in a context where we are in our Aboriginal territories, uh, but amongst dis dispossessed lands uh, has meant me learning throughout my entire life about what it means to be a, a dispossessed indigenous person to lands that that we consider not just as like relative, but as key to how we maintain the balance of the world so that everyone can be healthy and everyone can have what they need and everyone can be taken care of. What what we what they talk about in Native American studies, what they talk about when we look at the history of the United States is that all of this history has been about the dispossessing of indigenous lands. And that what it ultimately comes down to is who owns the land, who runs the land, who has the land in their possession. And while we can tell stories about movements like the gold rush, which you think is about gold or the mission system, which you think is about like converting native people, it actually is always about land because land is fundamentally what can build these nations. And that dispossessed land now exists as um, people's homes and people's cities and people's counties and districts. And to imagine it as a place where people have been, uh, where what it took to build that. And what we constantly talk about, especially in Native studies, is that you cannot build this nation that we live in, this place that we inhabit without violence. And that that violence pervaded all of these historical movements. And when we try to take that violence out of those historical movements to talk about them as like, oh, they were converting Indians in the missions, or they were building gold rush opportunities through our economy, what you take out is the violence that it truly took to dispossession, to dispossess indigenous peoples of land. So what that means is that we are the peoples who had to live through and function in spite of that violence. And for us to still be here to this day, uh, rebuilding and building and maintaining ongoing connections to land and more than human relatives, the animals, the flora, the fauna, that's something I think that we need to acknowledge as really key to what it then means to help indigenous peoples to, to really reconnect to land spaces because that violence um, that pervades, that grows, that festers, that builds something. And we need to be able to sort of address that as a nation, as a group of people, but also as people who have to all live here together. And what I'm always explaining to people, especially about our territory and region, is that for us, our connections to this land are unbroken, um, even though you may think of it as that we were here a long time ago, we are still here. We are still doing the same ceremonies. We are still connecting in the same ways. And that unbroken connection uh, is something that's really important to how we establish what do we need to do to make the land uh, maintain itself, to be healthy. So I always say to people, when you're talking about climate, building climate resiliency, what you're talking about is uplifting and upholding indigenous approaches to how we care for the land itself. When you're talking about how do we restore areas, you're talking about indigenous understandings of what the land could and has been and should be, and who are we going to functionally restore it for. Um, for me, dispossession also means that when I travel around these places, um, I can name places where truly uh, egregious things have been um, perpetuated against people uh, that I know, people in my families, people in my histories. I can name places that we uh, should still be in. I can name places where sacred places are that are now owned by non-Native people and we cannot get access to them. Um, and I think that to understand us as both 
a part of this historical dispossession, that ongoing dispossession continues because law, policy, uh, the, the, the systems that have been set up don't, uh, don't function in a way that actually moves toward our reconnection to those places. And that's why I think I do the work that I do on Land Back. Thank you for that, Kutcha. Um, Laura, I would love to hear your perspective. We just heard from, you know, uh, two wonderful speakers who are talking about what's happening here in California, but I'd really love to hear your perspective um, coming outside of, uh, outside of the state. Yeah, sure, thank you. So I'm Muskogee Creek and our, our people are originally from the Southeastern United States, which is Georgia and Alabama. And, you know, that's where our emergence story starts from is the Southeast. So these are our Aboriginal homelands. Um, we're currently living in our treaty homelands, but um, with settler colonialism, just we kept having our, our lands chipped away pretty much by coercion. So, you know, over time, we kept getting pushed over in our towns, moving over into um, Alabama. And what's sort of complicated about Muskogee Nation is that we had 50 plus tribal towns and those townships operated more like city states. So they were their own autonomous entities. And kind of this invention of Creek Nation was something that was necessary for, um, I guess, Europeans to understand how to enter into negotiations with us. They wanted a head person like how they had a head person. Um, so, yeah, this dis dispossession happened. You know, most of us are familiar with the Trail of Tears. And so moving... 1500 miles away from our original homelands into territory that we didn't know, trying to make a way again um, in lands that we didn't know. And people say that, that there weren't any babies that made it to the end of the trail. So we lost a lot of folks and I mean, it was straight up genocide. Um, and that sort of dispossession of land is really kind of predicated on the doctrine of discovery and that idea that um, indigenous people are not fully human if they're not Christians. So this is empty land that's open for the taking. So it, it was, um, the violence was rooted in Christianity, right? So, um, like that's kind of, that's kind of the big picture. But, you know, once we were here in Indian territory, um, probably around the, the end of the 19th century, there were there was the Dawes Act in 1889, but it really didn't get implement, implemented in Muskogee Nation territory until the late, Night, or the early 1900s. And people did not want their communal land base parceled up into these um, land parcels, right? The allotments. And we did have kind of this movement called the Crazy Snake Rebellion or Chitto Harjo. He was an individual that really um, was going against this idea of taking allotments. And what's sort of interesting today is that that's how we um, trace our membership in the tribe if you're on the Dawes rolls. So, I mean, that's kind of where we're at today. And, but I would say that there is a land back movement happening in Atlanta and Georgia right now. And I feel like I'm in the middle of this really kind of pivotal moment for Muscogee people. Um, and that's sort of how I ended up at Emory University this year, and I, which is in Atlanta in our original homelands. Um, and that that dispossession, you know, just to kind of echo some of the things that Kutcha said about, you know, we're still doing our ceremonies. So we carried our fires with us and we reignited those fires in these homelands and made this place our space. And 
I was talking with my daughter a couple of days ago. We were on our way to talk about, um, to do kind of a teach-in about what's happening with Cop City in Atlanta and to talk about the Olani Forest. And, and it's kind of like, it's not that we didn't want to go back. It's that we didn't have the resources or even know where to begin to go. And I feel like now in the past five or so years that there's been more of a move and definitely within the past three years, especially around Cop City, there's sort of like a bigger movement of going home. And, um, you know, we say that the land still knows us and the land still calls us back. And I don't see those relationships as being severed either, you know, just to echo also what Kutcher was saying, that when I entered those lands and those trees and that forest, um, that I, I felt something, um, that idea of Muskogee energy and transfer of energy between entities that, yeah, they, they recognize me and I recognize them. Um, that's a form of land back to me, whether it has private property ownership, there's this idea of these emergence geographies that show up in different ways of of us being able to carry out what we need to do to be the Muscogee people that we need to be, even though there's private land. So some of that might be like these ephemeral geographies where we show up, maybe where we're not supposed to be according to like private property ownership. But to me, that's a form of land back as well. So I'll stop there. That's a, a really um, excellent response. And I, I think you're kind of jumping us into really my next question was if, um, you know, we're talking about land back today, and I think this is a moment um, in the United States and perhaps globally where your average person who maybe is not native is finally hearing these words land back and maybe are trying to make sense of what that means. Um, I think this has been something that has been known in native communities for quite a while. And even a hundred years ago when native communities were trying to get land back, maybe it didn't have that same name, but this is the work that native communities have been doing for generations. Um, can either of you briefly do explain the land back movement um, and then I invite you to give examples of what land back is. It could be either from your own community or just communities that you're aware of throughout uh, the United States. Well, I mean, I can try to give kind of a functional overview of land back. Land back is really exciting because when you do a, when you do a lot of work where you're starting to educate people about what they may or may not understand about um, indigenous peoples and like the history of indigenous peoples, uh, they oftentimes will say like, well, I'm glad I learned everything, but like, what can I do? Like, what can I do about it? What can we do? And I always talk to people about what you can do is give land back um, or work toward land back. But a part of it is also just being willing to be the person who will come into a room and say, what about land back? Um, like, what have we talked about land back here instead of just the thing we're thinking about, right? Or going into any big organization where they're like, look at this cool thing you're going to do. And then going, well, why don't we just give land back to indigenous peoples? Like to, to functionally pull into a cultural imagination, these ideas that I have seen happen. And so what I will often say to people is land back is the, is the, indigenous reimagining of the world in the way that allows us to say, how are we actually going to functionally start to dismantle settler colonialism and the ways in which we have been taught to accept logics of settler colonialism. We've been taught to think about the world. We've been taught to think about all societies everywhere in all time operating under things like patriarchy, and um, operating under this idea that somehow uh, whoever owns the most land is the most powerful. And these ideas around capitalism and consumerism and consuming to the point that we can't even care for the planet anymore, right? And so what we're seeing now is a radical reimagining. And what I love about Land Back is that it's um, possible. And when you talk about what are the possibilities that we could build, Land Back to me is the possibility that starts to functionally think what are we doing to address some of these larger issues? 
I always say to people, we get we get grown up, like we get taught to live in this world in a very settler colonial box. And that box teaches us that this is what the world looks and functions like. And then one day somebody will come into your life, hopefully, and they'll be like, but you know, hey, you wanna know what's outside the box? You wanna see like what's outside the settler colonial box? And they'll start to tell you. And the people that represent the visionary idea of what's outside this box are indigenous peoples. Because what we are, are people who have lived before. Settler colonialism, capitalism, consumerism. We can tell you stories about what the world looks like, functions like. We can, we lived those memories. Those were carried on through us. That means we understand that this is a finite period of time and post this is something. Something better than a world where we can't even drink the water. We can't even breathe the air. And I always say to people like settler colonialism is so illogical as a system that we we accept that you can't drink water, breathe the air, or even have a home or the food that you need to eat. And we know that that isn't logical. We know as people, why would we ever create a society where there are people who don't have any food? Uh, and then we would say, well, that's impossible to create a society where everybody has food, except indigenous peoples can look at you and say, actually, before this, in this place that you live in, we had a society where everybody had food. And this is what we can think about as like the radical reimagining of what we think the world could look like. And land back is that starting point. A lot of people will sometimes say to me, I think land back is like the ending point to something. And I'm always like, no, land back is the starting point to the radical reimagining of the future that we want to build that actually helps us to live here, what we say from my area, in a good way. And what that means for us is land return. Um, now, sometimes people will say that's impossible or what does that even look like or what does that mean? We now have examples all over the United States of what land back looks like. I can point to examples in my own region. I can point to examples throughout California. I can point to moments where you're watching all different kinds of entities, nonprofit organizations, land trusts, government entities, cities, counties, right? Like states returning land and what that looks like. It's not an impossibility. In, in fact, it's happening on a, like, like it's happening more and more as we're watching people see that this is actually a really powerful and important way to move forward. Forward In my own region, I was there when they returned to Sacred Island to the tribe of, in the area that I live in called the Wiat tribe. I was there when it happened. It was a over 35, 40 year project of people trying to like get people to understand functionally that it was possible. And when it began, when the Wiat tribe first started to show up to city council meetings and saying, hey, could you return that sacred island that you stole? The first thing they got back was that's impossible. That will never happen. What are you talking about? How do we even understand that? And what it took was a person willing to come in and start to radically imagine what that could be and just asking every single time. And then people started asking different questions, thinking about things in a different way. And then suddenly what I'm seeing is the return in my lifetime. And so what I say to people is land back proves that we're not allowed to say that things are impossible, that we, we can't possibly build a better way of doing all of these things. It's not possible. I have seen those things happen. I will tell you, Land Back is the radical reimagining of what is possible. And then who do we want to be? And then what makes more sense to us? It also is, I will say, because I was there, probably one of the most joyful experiences you will ever have in your life is to be present at a land return for Indigenous peoples. I have never been in a space in my own like city that I live in where you know 500 people show up and we all are just happy to be there. Uh, we really love and um, are amazed by what's happening. There was so much joy in the room when the land was returned um, that everybody was so happy. And I thought that's what that's what decolonization and land back is. It's joy and happiness and community. It actually is an opportunity for us to build in the way that I think we should have built in the first place, which is through partnership and collaboration, not dispossession and violence and genocide. Yeah. Thank you, Kacha. Um, that was a really wonderful definition and inspiring one of what Land Back is. Um, for those of you uh, in the room, uh, you know, Kutcha mentioned Dulawat Island, which was returned to the Wiat tribe in Eureka, uh, California. That was December of 2018. 
Um, in July of 2020, a uh, roughly 2,000 acre parcel of weird wilderness along the Little Sur River was given back to the Eslin tribe of Monterey County. That was technically a real estate transaction, but truly a, a shift. Um, in February of 2021, the Minnesota Historical Society returned 114 acres of land to the Lower Sioux Indian community in Minnesota. And recently, um, where I'm from here in Santa Cruz, um, one and a half acres of the hills in Bonnie Dune were returned to the Amamutsun tribal band. So it is happening across the board, across the United States. I'm sure there are global, um, you know, uh, iterations of land back, but just to show that these things are happening. And I think this really brings up a really good question um, for Karina, actually, because Karina is really doing quite a bit with the Segorite Land Trust. Um, you have done amazing work um, in the way of land back and rematriation. I'm wondering, Karina, if you could tell us a little bit more about the strategies that the Segorite Land Trust have used to um, basically get land back and reacquaint yourselves with the land that was taken from you. And also if you could just kind of speak to what that means for your community. Thank you for that question, Katie. Thank you, Ketcha, so much for that wonderful way to talk about land back. And um, I think that, uh, you know, when we talk about as indigenous people from the Bay Area, our land is all built upon practically. You see an urbanization of the tribal territories. And so you also for decades now um, have seen an invisibilization of our people, right? We are not talked about in history except in that fourth little fourth grade piece of history about and we're talked about in the past. And so there's no future for us, right? And we are totally obliterated by the time you get to fifth grade history and you start talking about the gold rush and the horrific things that happened up in Northern California and other parts of uh, California, right? So it had taken uh, us um, over 30 years to actually put into the consciousness of people that we were still here that people began to talk about Ohlone in the presence, right? That we were, that so that when you can imagine that as a culture, again, a society, then you can begin to think about a future, right? And so it makes more sense that way. It was after a takeover of a sacred piece of land in 2011 uh, on the Carquina Strait, a, uh, um, a site called Segorite. It was a village site, one of the last strongholds for our ancestors before, before take, being taken into Mission Dolores in San Francisco and uh, Solano. And so when we took over that sacred site that had two uh, shell mounds or burial sites, a village site where we had uh, salmon ceremonies for thousands of years, um, that that place, when we took it over, by inner tribal people and people from all walks of life when we laid a sacred fire that it began to a movement also in the Bay Area of awakening. And that those ancestors allowed us to wake up the, the Bay Area and other parts of the country by beginning to say that to, in a different way that we're here. And that it allowed for the first cultural easement between two federally recognized tribes a um, a land um, a city and a park district, and it was not our tribe, even though that's our tribal land. The Carquin Straits are our tribal lands. It was two federally recognized tribes that were able to step in and make that cultural easement happen, which was amazing. That we are still able to go there and pray, but it set us on this trajectory to actually um, look at what land trust is as a non federally recognized tribe what are some of the tools that we had? And it was Beth Rose Middleton, a professor at UC Davis, who did her book called Trust in the Land that actually invited me to a land trust of native people in Southern California that gave me the idea to use a land trust to bring indigenous land back to indigenous hands. And Janella LaRose, who's the co-founder of the Scorate Land Trust and has been working with me for over 30 years doing this work around recognizing us in our territories, that this was a great way. But it really is, when I sat in that room of indigenous land trust holders, it was all indigenous men that were running the land trust. And so I was caught by that. I was like, this is interesting because as 
California Native women, there's a matriarchal societies in many places. And that because of colonization and because of the Spanish coming in, they refuse to talk to women leadership. And what does that look like? And how does that take away from um, what has happened in our tribal communities and where it needs to go back to? It's not just California natives because uh, Janella is Shoshone, Bannock and Ute and came here um, during the uh, 1960s, late 1960s um, through the American Indian movement and raised her children here. But it's in the Bay Area, this was a place of uh, forced relocation. People from different reservations came to the Bay Area and made this their home. And we've worked together with many people from all of those different nations to create a community. And so our land back movements really started with the sacred sites protection in the Bay Area for over 20 years, trying to stop development from happening at the Bay Street Mall at uh, schools in uh, Palo Alto and uh, buildings going up in different places along our waterways. These shell mounds that had been mapped by Nels Nelson over a hundred years ago um, allowed us to reconnect with our, our sacred places again. And we've been fighting one particular development for the last seven years at, in Berkeley on 4th and University the West Berkeley Shell Mound, the oldest of all uh, 425 of those shell mounds that reached the Bay Area, that was ringed around the Bay Area. But we started talking about how do we bring back land? You know, we didn't know um, at the beginning what that would look like. We began to think about little plots of land throughout our territory that we could begin to grow our own uh, traditional plants without having to ask for outside, you know, outside people, if we could actually gather um, to have a place to pray without actually having to ask permission to begin to think of those places. In 2016, Standing Rock happened and people from all, indigenous people from all across the world came and stood together to stop a pipeline. At that same time, in, you know, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, there were uh, hundreds of people that were um, raising money for Standing Rock and was doing a lot of things. But we had also done that work for uh, 30 years in the Bay Area. And our accomplice said, wait a minute, there's a sacred site that's being destroyed right now in Berkeley, the possibility. Let's also start to, to do that work here in our own home. And so the movement to save the West Berkeley Shell Mound really started at the same time. At the same time, a nonprofit went to Standing Rock and realized that they could do something different. Planting Justice was that uh, place. And so they offered John Ella and I the first quarter acre of land to be returned to us in 250 years. And we uh, had conditions on it. Imagine not having land for 250 years, but having conditions on having land returned. And we did because we didn't know who these people were and we had to build relationships with them and with the men and women who they worked with that were formerly incarcerated and newly migrated to our lands. And we did that work. And since that time in 2016, we have had land returned to us through uh, MOUs, through, um, through um, long-term leases, through other nonprofits buying land and putting the deed in our name, through the city of Oakland being the first city in the state of California to return uh, four acres of land to a tribe, a non-federally recognized tribe through a land trust. That that was a five-year process. It wasn't something that happened overnight, creating a blueprint for other tribes throughout California to use if cities would like to do that. There's always this thought and process of creating communities and working together to, to do all of that work. And then working with other land trusts across the country that are re, that are newly developing, uh, making those relationships to, to do that, and encouraging people that live in our territories that work, live, and play here to pay an honorary tax that we ask permission from um, seven generations to use when they got the uh, the uh, the act got the island returned. They asked an honorary tax there. And so there are multitude of ways of getting land back. It's, it doesn't necessarily need to be titled deed, which comes with its own headaches of taxes and um, all of the other nonprofit things that happen with it uh, 
but um, it can happen in a multitude of ways. And that's how we've done it here in the Bay Area. Thank you, Karina. It sounds like this work has been going for quite a long time. It's not, not something that happens overnight. And while we have a name for Land Back, this is something that, again, people have been working on for generations. So thank you for that. One of the things, Karina, you mentioned, and, and this is kind of a question for Laura now, is you mentioned futurities, indigenous futurities. And Laura, in your work, you talk a lot about indigenous futurities and what that means specifically for Muscogee Creek people. Um, can you talk about how Land Back is central to indigenous futurities? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's actually um, my point of departure when I think about land back. So with the Walani Forest and Cop City issue, um, I had my class work on actually a, a plan of what a future tribal town could look like in that space. So it's kind of like... I don't wait on permission. I don't wait for the land to be in place. It's like, let's start dreaming now what we want in that space. Because one, Cop City will never be built. I have to say it so it, to manifest it, right? Cop City will never be built. So how can we be ready in thinking what we care about, what we wish for? And yeah, so that's, that's really the biggest part of kind of what I what I'm always thinking about. So really love to hear about land trust. And that's something that I've been thinking about increasingly for the Georgia area uh, and also for the Tulsa area. Um, that's kind of another project in thinking about, you know, the city is a Muscogee word, but it's sort of like you don't really hear that consciousness and recognition that Karina talked about and sort of the same thing in Atlanta. You don't hear that recognition or consciousness about Muscogee people kind of in larger discourse about the area. So like say for the city of Tulsa, what would it look like if we had a Muscogee tribal town in the area of town where our council oak tree is. So our council oak tree is where we established our first um, our first tribal town. So bringing the ceremonial fires and reigniting there and sanctifying that space. So what would it look like instead of there being like houses and like apartment buildings? There's actually a parking lot right for an apartment building right next to this like really important site. But what would it look like to imagine that space in a way that we need it? Or what would it look like to imagine a space in Alabama that sort of is designed within a Muscogee kind of use of space and architecture and to have a place for people to be housed or to be based, to be able to go and visit their tribal town. So that's kind of a larger project for me is kind of um, taking the knowledge aspect from the communities, the felt knowledge though, how do you sort of grapple with the felt knowledge of these tribal towns so that we can, we can be connected across space and time to our ancestors that were in those spaces. And so for me, part of that futurity is trying to get as many Muscogee people as I can to the Southeast to be able to visit their homelands because like, like kind of my, my source of drive for that is seeing a lot of our tribal members who have transitioned from this material world before they could ever, ever see our ancestral homelands. So like how, how can we sort of think that through and imagine futurity that way, but how can we also imagine futurity in and with that land for all sorts of folks that are Muscogee. Because often, yeah, it is like, like if we're looking at the politics of recognition, a lot of this kind of work is happening at a grassroots level. It's not happening within the tribe. And I feel like that's a very sort of indigenous feminism is that this is happening at a grassroots level. It's trying to be inclusive of everyone. So. 
that means women, children, two-spirit, trans, disabled folks. So like, how do you start imagining that? So one way is, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get people to the Southeast, how to establish space where we can be and just be. Like, I think that that was something that folks always thought was weird. Like me wanting to get land just to have it, to go on it, that it's not being used in a productive way, right? So um, yeah, the idea of getting land so people can be on it and deepen their connection to the plants, the animals, um, being in reciprocal relations. So it's like, maybe I'm harvesting or gathering, but I'm also doing something that's going to benefit the flora and fauna. It's not just a one-way sort of relationship. But um, yeah, the land trust part, I think for a lot of folks, it's, we don't know where to go. I mean, like, even for me, a couple of months ago, we, I was sort of stranded in Atlanta with my daughter and all the hotels were booked up and the hotel that I took an Uber to sight unseen, I actually think it was a sex trafficking hotel. So it's kind of like, you know, if our relatives are trying to come into these spaces and they don't really know their way either, how can you start establishing Muskogee, like concrete Muskogee places that they know it's okay to be right here? Um, yeah, so in terms of futurity, I think that that's the biggest thing that I'm always like whipping out paper and asking people to, to map a future and what do they want it to look like? And trying to map and think about all kinds of folks because often even with mapping, indigenous mapping, what I've seen is that they convene with the men and then we find out where fishing and hunting and that sort of land use happens. But then we never hear about how anybody else uses the land. And so any sort of land back actions are sort of elevating the land use of the men in the community, but it gets pushed forward as this is what this is what the tribe wants. So for me, kind of that futurity aspect is making sure that everybody kind of has their thumbprint on what kind of future. And so kind of with that blueprint, trying to move forward and and make it happen. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. That was such a great response. And um Something you brought up is the idea of this being, you know, truly like a feminist project. So actually, um, I have a question for all three of you. And if I could just give it to you first, Laura, is in your experience, how is Land Back or the Land Back movement a feminist project? Like, how does gender show up in those spaces? So if I can hand it to Laura and then Kacha and Karina. I mean, I think part of it. I would just echo again kind of what I said about um, ensuring that nobody's left out. So that idea, one of caretaking. So how are we making sure that nobody's left out? Because I've been in plenty of projects where, um, not necessarily with my own tribe, but I've worked on different community projects where the men actively took out anything that the women and two-spirit folks had to say. And they wanted whatever the future was for the tribe in their vision. And then it's always under this sort of idea of this is indigenous, but, or even land back, like to what degree is like land back patriarchal? So like, I know that even right now in Cop City, there's like an indigenous presence there, but there aren't any Muskogee people. And it just seems like, okay, if this is something that you're aiming towards, like how about folding in more Muskogee people and let us speak for ourselves or funnel resources towards us. And I think even that of like kind of pointing out these blind spots for folks, that's part of it. Um, and again, the other thing that I was saying about 
the mapping, but I think the biggest thing is about relationships. And so I'll kind of frame it this way. And this idea that a lot of us carry trauma, our communities carry trauma, especially like around boarding school and maybe folks aren't as comfortable like expressing their feelings and normalizing that. I think that that's part of it too, is normalizing being able to express your felt knowledge, your feelings, your emotions. It's sort of like from boarding school, having to push it down and to put on like this hard face. And I feel like we still have to do that like in different spaces, but how can we normalize that? Because I know for a lot of times, like I really felt like a, a deep emotional co connection to the land. And I know a lot of other folks did, and they would sometimes preface it like, I don't want to sound corny, but, and it's like, no, it's okay. Like, you know, I think that that's part of it too, is recognizing that we have these deep relationships across time and space that we want to see continue. And if we want them to continue, that we have to kind of be okay with that, you know, the emotive part. So I think about Leanne Simpson's work and uh, Pedagogy of the Land and where she, like the original one, not the one from her book, but the original one where she's talking about this little girl that's out learning from the land and she, see this, she sees this squirrel tapping um, a tree to get maple syrup and then she comes back and tells her story. And she's telling her story and her mom gently puts her hand on her back and encourages her. And then they do this sugar reduction with deer meat. And it's sort of like this child is believed. And I know when I've taught that before, people are like, wow, that's a trip that they listen to this kid. And I feel like that's indigenous feminism that everybody has a say, everybody has value, everybody has something to bring to the table and recognizing that. Um, the other thing with, I guess, with Cop City as well, um, that there's a lot of different organizing going on. And with some of it, they are not sort of abiding by like Muskogee ways of being on and with the land. So I don't know if that's some COINTELPRO stuff going on, but like the idea of um, throwing Molotov cocktails or setting something on fire in the forest, like it just, it doesn't match up with like indigenous feminisms of caretaking, being in reciprocal relations. And like, for me, that was pretty hurtful to, to hear that, you know, that these trees were burned when we're there and we're trying to like protect Walani forest, but it's sort of like, I don't know, I'll leave it there. I can go on and on about that so I'll leave it there. all right thank you Laura uh Kutcha can I can I ask how uh in your experience how is land back or the land back movement a feminist project I mean I think at, at the heart of what feminism has brought to a discussion about the world that we want to live in and the world that we we want to create is when how do we think about the the systems that are in place to to sort of justify ongoing patriarchy, colonialism, capitalism, exploitation, and what does it mean to liberate ourselves from that and building what the world could be and what I think the vision of the world should have been for, and probably was for like a very, very long time, which is simply to say like, all of us should have a space to be able to work, live and function together in a way where we care for each other and our more than human relatives. And feminism asks us to center the most marginalized. I mean, I mean, the feminism that I really talk about and forward and think about is like the ways in which we understand the experiences of some of the most marginalized voices in the, in the worlds that we live in. And then what does that mean for us about how we want to create a society that uplifts and doesn't uh, dispossess and push down upon. And to me, land back is saying to people, land has functionally become a space of patriarchy and it has been, it has been put into a patriarchal 
way of being, which is private property ownership for capital and consumption uh, and leaving out primarily um, women, but also queer folks in what it means to be the uh, the managers and the, the people who are able to make decisions about that land. So when they're negotiating treaties with indigenous tribes, indigenous peoples of the Americas, many of them were feminist cultures and societies. They had equal representation for women, for queer folks. Um, they had They were really thinking about, and this is because when you've lived in a place for thousands upon thousands of years, I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to understand that one of the first things you figure out is you, it, a, a, a culture where only men are in charge is never going to work. Um, and so I think that didn't take, that probably didn't take us all thousands of years to figure out, but man, did we figure that out real quick and be like, hey, so when you leave women out of that conversation, that's a problem. When you start to say that only heterosexism is the way the world is, that's a problem because the world itself is not a heterosexual world. The nature itself doesn't live under heteropatriarchy and heterosexism. And so when you, if you're functionally able to learn in the world, you kind of go like, oh, wait a minute. We're like, we're like the ones pushing against what is the way that the world functions because valuing a diversity of perspective, experience, ideas, that's the thing that's gonna help you survive. It is, it is, um, it is not logical to say everybody has to be in this type of relationship. Everybody has to have this point of view. And in fact, many indigenous peoples and cultures, when they would encounter people who now we would call um, like on the spectrum, right? Or we would say like, oh, they're very different than us. They're not there. And we would sort of start to like take them out of, like we would put them on an abnormal spectrum. Uh, indigenous peoples would say that's a diversity of thought and experience that is very valuable to a society. How, why would you only want the same way that people think to only be the way that people think and act in how they put something together? You need everybody's perspective. And so we really valued that. And I think when we talk about land back, it's about restoring those types of ways of approaching policy, restoration, uh, climate resiliency that really values a diversity of experience and thought that comes from feminist values that everybody needs to have a place at the table to be able to have that conversation. And what I really think is important is like treaty negotiations, especially at even any kind of negotiations about nationhood, any ways that they were setting forth policy in the federal government. One of the first things that they were trying to do was to really make indigenous peoples into straight um, heterosexual relationships that value consumerism, consumption, and capitalism. There's a very popular example that's happening right now where if you're talking about like killers of the flower moon and this idea of like who owns land, indigenous people's values is that women could own property and that women could be the primary property owners. And then you start to see whole federal government systems that are set up to dispossess indigenous women of land and really saying women should not be landowners, women should not be in charge of these decision makings. You see the same thing with queer folks where they're saying the only way that that you can inherit, have, buy, or keep your property is if you are in a heterosexual relationship and you are married to somebody of the opposite sex, but we don't recognize families or queer values and therefore we are erasing your rights and your ability to navigate these land spaces. So the restoration of that through land back is also able to restore like feminist values that really help us to understand that those diversities of experiences are gonna be the only way that we can answer the question, like what are we supposed to do now? I tell people all the time, if the question is like, what are we supposed to do now? The answer is land back, because then we can start having real conversations about what it means to restore this planet back because it has been so scarred by colonialism and capitalism and these ideas that have been forwarded to us as if they are natural and normal. And I love land back as a space that we can start to see what it means to live as a feminist culture and society in a way that demonstrates that it's not about like, um, like, like return violence or revenge or the, it's actually about like, what does it mean to function in a way where everybody can drink the water, right? Like everybody is cared for. Uh, I actually think it's something that when we think about like the long period of time that we've been here and we say for time immemorial, um, we, had to, we had to learn lessons along the way about what it meant to manage this place and how to live here. My point is always, we're just starting from 
like 10 to 15 to 100,000 years ahead of you of all of those scientific experiments, like observational analysis, starts and stops, ways of doing that had uh, a colonial culture come in and instead of being like, I will dispossess and destroy you, said, you know stuff and I know stuff and we should know stuff together. Imagine how far ahead we would be. And when we think about who's talked about as sort of the primitive peoples of these moments, we were always taught that indigenous peoples were primitive hunter gatherers. And what that meant is we weren't doing anything with the land, but what that actually meant is we weren't operating under an assumption of private property consumption and capitalism. We weren't exploit, we weren't exploiting. And so therefore we were primitive. And my great grandfather actually did this great thing. He would, he, he wrote a document that I refer to a lot, but one of the quotes that has always stuck with me is he said that what he has learned in his life, and he was alive up until like the very early, um, like the late eighties, but he had lived like all through like the late 1800s and 1900s. And what he said is what I've learned throughout my life is that indigenous peoples were some of the most advanced cultures and societies that you will ever encounter. And part of that is because of their feminist values, right? The ways that they valued the, like the way that we treat all folks. And he said, the, and what he, he ends this with, the civilization that patterns itself off the death of human lives is poorly civilized. And I just sit with that a lot in terms of what land return is, is about. It's about returning to a way that we can manage and build that is based on thousands upon thousands of years of knowledge of how this place can be maintained in a way that our values reflect who we truly are as a culture and society, instead of just reflecting a capitalistic consumer, like take until you, until everything runs out, there's not enough for everybody kind of way that we've been taught to believe. Great, thank you so much, Katja. Um, we will eventually head into Q&A shortly, but I have a question um, in both uh, Laura and uh, Katja's responses to that question brought up a question for me specifically for Karina, um, just because of the work she does with the Segorite Land Trust. So Karina, I'm wondering if you could um, speak to the concept of rematriation. I know you brought that up um, a little while ago. If you could tell us what, rematri what rematriation is and what that looks like in the work of the Segorite Land Trust. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Katie. And thanks, Laura and Ketcha for the, uh, those beautiful answers. I you know, I, we talk about rematriation and it's, uh, and we hope that it doesn't take off like, and it kind of has, but you know, this whole idea of decolonize everything um, and that happened a few years back, you know, but rematriation is really coming back to full circle. It's about remembering women's roles inside of our traditional societies and how we work very much uh, like what Ketcha and, and Laura were talking about is about how do we include everybody, right? How do we do the work that our ancestors are calling us to do? Sorry, I have somebody in the background. Sorry. Um, when we start talking about rematriation, we had to look at, Janelle and I had a conversation when we started the land trust about what does that look like? And I kind of talked about how it was that when I went to this land trust meeting, there were all of these native men that were in charge of land trust. And I met this guy, Doom Lankard, who was a Athabascan, an Alaska native man who saved like 140,000 acres of his traditional territory after the Exxon Valdez bill. But I asked him about that particular thing about is this, I noticed that there were all men there and there was no women leadership. And I said, is this a boys club? And he kind of laughed and he said, yeah, but not just native land trusts. All land trusts are pretty much run by men. So when I came back to talk to Janella about this concept of having a land trust, we started talking about that, that idea. What does it look like that men are the ones that are in charge of land? And how does that correlate with what has happened on these lands, right? With settler colonial violence and patriarchal violence that happened continuously through the Spanish misinization who would not talk to women, who would not see the leadership of women in our tribes, would only talk to the men. So, but dispossessed us first from our sacred, first from our ceremonies, first from the sacred, right? 
you take away that, and then you take away the women's power, the right to speak on behalf of a people, the right to have any kind of uh, uh, say about what's happening, right? And then you begin to rape and violate women the same way you begin to rape and violate the lands, that you begin to correlate those two things together as possessions, right? And that has happened continuously through the Mexican Rancho period, through the continued occupation of the United States government on our lands, that we are invisibilized in those kinds of ways. So that over the last few hundred years that that has continuously happened to us. And rematriation is about the remembering of us coming back to being human beings again, that as indigenous women, our right is to stand up and to be leaders for our children and for those next seven generations, that we have the songs for our waterways, our basket making materials, our medicines, that we as indigenous women are the and our queer non-binary relatives have always been the ones that actually work with bringing life into this earth and are also the ones that are quite honestly the ones that help to prepare those that are leaving this earth. And so those are important roles that we hold, right? As indigenous women in California, the roundhouse was also ours and we don't see that anymore, right? But that we called when the ceremonies were gonna happen. We decided who was going to be those dancers. We decided when, who was going to get that firewood. All of those different roles was all matrilineal, right? It was all of those kinds of things. And so rematriation is really about remembering also remembering what our roles are and our responsibilities. Rematriation also is about bringing our indigenous men back into right relationship again, because they lost what their relationship was, what their, and, um, their sacred responsibilities were when colonization happened. That was taken away from them as well. And so it's about bringing along, not just our sisters and grandmas and aunties and daughters, but also our sons and our uncles and our brothers and our nephews with us so that we could bring this balance back into the lands again. When we do that kind of work, we also talk, do what we were taught, what uh, Kucha and uh, Laura were talking about is being inclusive of everybody. We learned that through the takeover at Segorite, that when people came here, they weren't given a, a, a job, but they found out what their responsibility was by knowing who they were and fitting into the community. And that we wanted to bring those lessons along when we started the land trust, that we would bring people on, not necessarily that they knew about traditional ecological knowledges, but that they would learn with the lands how to do those specific things. That when people came into Segorite, that they would begin to have, build those relationships again and not just as indigenous people, but to invite people that now live in our territory to do work days with us, to be in touch with the land again, as humanly as we are supposed to be, that for millennium, that people all over the world had a connection with the land and the waters, and that to remember what that is to do that work again. So rematriation is about calling everybody in, to fight against patriarchal violence, to fight against the settler colonial ideas of, of private land ownership. Who has the right to own someone else's sacred site? It is only through private land ownership that was brought here, a, uh, a idea that was foreign to these places, that people can actually do that. They can buy and sell places that you have prayed on since time immemorial. That rematriation actually is reimagining this world in a better place, reimagining a world where we have right relationship with fire again, good air to breathe, like Kutch has said, good water to drink, good land to grow our, our, our foods and medicines on. And so it's about all of that. It's about bringing us back into a ceremony. When we look at the world and what happened during COVID and those that were in women's leadership, those, those countries that had women leadership, we can see how they thought of their whole communities as whole. Very different than what it looked like to be under men's leadership and really trying to get people to the point of being productive again and back on the work field and not thinking about stuff. And so when we do this work of rematriation, we think about bringing in indigenous women to do the work of that. 
We bring in our non-binary queer folks that are working with us. We bring in indigenous people from other parts of the world. And we bring in people, young people to work with us as well as everyone else that creates their home in our territories. Uh, thank you so much, Karina. That was really wonderful. Uh, now it's a good time to transition into our Q&A. We have a little less than 20 minutes left for the conversations. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Again, just reminding folks, please put your, your questions into the Q&A box. I'm going to start with this one right here. Um, it says, thank you for all your insight and work. It is an honor to learn from you. How can we effectively challenge the deeply rooted settler colonial narrative worldview? This worldview is being illuminated right now as the ongoing colonization and dispossession of Palestine, and it is shedding new light onto the ongoing colonization and dispossession of Turtle Island. Um, can one of our speakers uh, respond to, or one or all of our speakers respond to this question? I mean, I just, I just want to say that, um, like, as an indigenous person that does work from a very academic and sort of scholarly perspective, that has tried to read as much as possible about ongoing issues of settler colonialism throughout all of history, um, and that I can give like a lot of theoretical interventions to things all the time, where I'm like, so and so says this or whatnot. It is, it is not, and it's not an easy way to have to exist when you are trying to do decolonial and anti-capitalist and you're trying to dismantle like a structure uh, like of settler colonialism, it's sometimes very exhausting and, and really hard um, on your body, on your mind, on your sort of like way of walking through the world that we get taught a lot in spaces that we're not supposed to take moments to pause and really acknowledge that type of ongoing grief and that that type of on that that way that we can walk through this world and point to spaces and places where very very likely our own family members or people that um, we are very close to have been affected by ongoing settler colonialism. And I can use several examples from my own life and my own community. I can talk about what it means to live in a way where I often will say to people when I go do talks about land back and I'll say, you know, after I get done with talk, sometimes people will come up to me and they will like be crying and they'll say things like, I, I, I mourn for like the loss of your people and the end of the red man. And like, they'll say these things like, like they don't own a bunch of land that they couldn't just give me. Um, that I'm like, well, and and actually I saw a really great thing where this person was on TikTok was like, you know what, why don't you like, why don't we start saying like we should buy an Indian a meal or we should like sit down and like every time you see a native person like send them a free like coffee or something or like what about sending them a, a pork chop like anything to just be like hey here you are uh, I've never had anybody do that but I have had them come up to be like I'm so disheartened by learning about this and I always say to people like it's really hard as a person who I I don't think I'm a, I don't think I'm given the same type of space as an indigenous woman to wear that kind of grief in public. I don't know what people would do if I grieved my peoples, my lands, my history publicly. If I showed like what that really meant to exist in spaces where I know that true violence was enacted against peoples. Um, and that that's a really difficult position to constantly be in, to sort of navigate how do I educate people, but then also am living this experience. And what I will say is what I've learned throughout my, my, my lifespan of doing this type of work is I, I no longer will allow people to gaslight me into believing that settler colonialism isn't a thing and doesn't exist. I will no longer allow people to ask me questions that they feel like will allow for a space of like um, equal opportunity discussions. Uh, one of my favorites is now that I'm older, uh, it used to be someone would come up and they would say, well, can't you tell me anything good that settler colonialism did? Like, isn't there like, uh, can't we think about something good that settler colonialism did? And I'm old enough now that I will legit look at people and say, there's nothing good that settler colonialism did. That's it. It's just not a good thing. There is absolutely nothing good that I can name for you. And then they get very like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? And then eventually someone will say to me, well, you're welcome for your iPhone. 
or you're welcome. Actually, one time I had a guy say, you're welcome for pants, right? Like, like these are the good things that settler colonialism did. And I always have to say, first of all, we had pants, but okay. Uh, but second of all, um, thanks for my iPhone. I kind of want to tell people like, hey, maybe if we didn't have settler colonialism, we wouldn't all have to have iPhones that were made by tiny little children that are enslaved in other countries. Like maybe we would have built a much better system than the one that we have. Like we have to start to point out that this thing exists and that it's happening and that it is real and that it has real effects and that it is not something that people sort of made up or are leaning into because they want something or they think they deserve. It's an actual thing. And that that actual thing is a structure that exists all around us that is trying to normalize itself to us. And that when we make it normal, when we make it like a logical thing, we forget that like it is so illogical that it cannot possibly sustain itself. And the only way it sustains itself is through violence. So I'm, I'll say this for what's happening in the world right now. It is, go, it is um, it's a palpable mourning by indigenous peoples to watch as people are trying to once again, gaslight people into believing that this structure isn't doing what it was set forward to do from the beginning, which is to destroy, to replace, to, to enact violence, and then to make sure that the that we are taught that somehow somehow our gut feelings about this are not correct that somehow we are not the ones that truly understand what's going on that there's something bigger we have to understand and and I don't think that as people who do this work with the structure of settler colonialism I don't think we have to apologize anymore for saying to people no there's there's nothing good that settler colonialism does we are not going to be gaslit into believing that these things aren't happening. And we are going to be the people that continue to bring it up, even when it is something that people keep telling us we shouldn't bring up. And what I think is really important is that the more that you do that, the more that you're willing to come into spaces and do that, what you will start to find out is there's more of people like you than you thought. And they were all waiting for somebody to say something. And they were all needing that. And what I tell people now is I've stopped coming into spaces to talk to people that I have to convince to get on the land back decolonization train because the train is moving and it's doing really cool stuff. And we're having like a lot of fun on the decolonial train, just in case you were wondering, because we're all really hilarious and we are re and we really like each other and we're trying to do good work. So like we're all on there having fun and there's all these people going, well, I don't know. I don't know if I want to like give land back. I don't, and I'm like, all right, cool. Stay over there on and wait. Uh, when you're ready, the train will come by again someday. But like we're on the train. So like let's have different conversations where we're not centering people that need to be convinced. We're not centering people who are trying to find a reason not to. We're centering those of us that are ready, ready to do the work, ready to call out the experience, ready to make the difference ready and i know there's more there's more of us out there than we think and i think that we can build that kind of coalition so that we can we all know that we're not the we're not making it up that we are having these experiences and they are really important Thank you, Katja. Um, I see a lot of head nodding from both Karina and Laura. It sounded like that really much, uh, very much resonated with you as well. Um, I want to go on to another question in the chat. I think this is related to the previous question. Um, I'd love to hear the panel speak about Indigenous feminist solidarity with Palestine and if and how they see the land back struggle working in connection with the pursuit of Palestinian liberation. Again, this is an open question for all of our panelists um, if you'd like to engage this question. I'm going to ask people to go to my Facebook page or and or my IG and I wrote a statement um, and I'll read an excerpt of the statement right now, but please go and read the rest of the statement because, you know, as um, as a, a, someone that's in the Bay Area that has been working on Indigenous rights for decades and has been working on protecting and preserving my our sacred sites for decades, we have brought with us especially we have saw um, during the last seven years of the West Berkeley Shama bringing people to that site together. We have connected our sacred sites to the sacred sites on Mauna Kea. 
to the um, leadership of uh, chiefs coming from the Amazon and praying with us. We have had people speaking on the genocide of Kashmir, of the displacement of our Palestinian relatives. We have had Christians and Muslims and Jewish people all praying at the same time together with each other. We have brought Tibetan chanters and, um, and Korean drummers and Aztec dancers all there that this is a place that actually um, resonates with people from all walks of life together, that this is a movement building, right? And when you build a movement with people that you have to see what are those things that connect us together and those things that have connected us together, the ugliness that has connected us together is settle of colonial violence, right? When you talk about all of these things, but when we talk about what's happening in Palestine as indigenous people that have been forgotten on our own lands, right? And I only speak as the tribal chair of my tribe um, in this case, that we look at this. And I wrote, settlers ha have always called American Indian people savages, and they created new laws and policies to legalize the massacre of my people and to justify the thefts of our lands. The new laws they created made it legal to hunt and exterminate Indians, legalize the slavery of Indian people and young children, create pollution and destruction of our food and waterways to starve us out. And their new laws and policies made it normal to kill thousands of Indian women and children as strategies for exterminating future generations so that we wouldn't survive. I see that happening right now with thousands of Palestinian babies dying with women dying. And that, of course, we connect our, we are in solidarity, solidarity with our Palestinian relatives that are seeing that happen. When I look and I participate in the marches that are happening, and those young people that are doing the work day after day to ensure that their voices are heard and that we're standing in solidarity with them, that they have lost 15, 18, 25 relatives just this time, and they're here, and this is the work that they do. It is our responsibility as people that are on this land that we do that work with them um, to ensure that their future generations are here. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, we have a couple more questions and about five minutes left here. So I wanna try and get to these if we can. Um, any insights regarding land back in Hawaii? That's one of the questions that we have here. If anybody can offer any response to that. I'll say, yeah, give all the land back in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. I mean, That's like, the answer. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And to me, when people learn about that historical moment of like what happened in Hawaii, it's so obvious. It was so obvious that the United States government itself was like, oh yeah, that was illegal. That was like totally illegal what we did. I will often explain to people like 90% of federal Indian law is tribes going to the Supreme Court asking the United States to follow their own laws. They're like, hey, you guys should like follow your laws. And then they actually, the Supreme Court will go, I don't wanna. Uh, and then find a reason why they don't wanna. Or they'll be like, you're right, we should. And then the other branches will be like, we don't wanna, right? Like the idea being that it's all illegal. In Hawaii, especially, I think it's all over the place, but I think we should, Hawaii should be returned to the indigenous peoples, flat out, period, point blank, stop all of it. Um, and I do think that like there was a vision for that. I think uh, Hawaiian peoples from the very beginning are, are building a vision for like what it means to be a space that many people would like to come to and be a part of. How do we build that as a nation, right? Um, I think that that has to be at the tip of everybody's tongue. I think that one of my favorite experiences in Hawaii, I was there one time. My favorite thing to do when I go to these like cities is I take their red bus tours. I like to see how cities portray public history and like what they talk about. I've learned, I learned a lot of crazy stuff. Like when I went on the one in San Diego about how they talk about indigenous peoples, which I thought was just really funny. And I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting to see when tourists come, what do they learn? 
about this city. So I went on one when I was in Hawaii and I was just like not looking forward to the way they were going to talk about the occupation of Hawaii, the continued ongoing occupation and dispossession of lands from indigenous peoples, the sort of like the really kind of crazy way that people will come out and be like, I'm a good person, but I own like a hundred acres in Hawaii. And you're like, cool, give all that back, like be a good person. And the guy who was leading the tour, he like is talking. And at one point he goes, oh, this is the palace where our queen would live. And then she was imprisoned there by a colonial government. He's like, you know, because the thing is, is like, we need you all to just leave. Like, we don't want you to leave forever, but we want you to leave so we can get our land back. And then we can start to build this place the way it should be. And then we can invite people as we see fit. Land back is this. And he starts giving this like lecture on the red bus tour. And I'm like in the back all by myself. And after he was done, I was like, whoo. And everybody was looking around like, wait, I, what is happening? Like we're start, we're talking about, and I thought that's what we need to do is it needs to become part of an everyday conversation. We should always be asking that question of everybody when Oprah's out there raising money, trying to get people to give her money so she can do stuff in Maui to help with the fires. The amount of people that I saw writing back being like, why don't you start by giving up all your land, Oprah? Like to think about, to make ridiculous this idea that somehow the possession of indigenous lands is naturalized and settled. It is not settled. And we have to remember that all the time. These claims, these ideas, these owners, these are not settled disputes. These are ongoing discussions. And, and I know so many tribal examples of tribes that refused to settle that conversation because they were saying, look, you all might think that we're gonna settle this over the next five, 10, 15 years, but we will wait 150 years if we have to, and we are not going to settle. And to remember that about indigenous peoples, we are, we are long planners. We are not just going like, oh yeah, maybe 10 years. We're, we're like 150 years from now, this is what we're gonna be doing here. When we talk about dam removal in our region, they said to us, that could take 150 years. And we're like, good, we're gonna keep going until it happens because it will happen. And if it's beneficial to those of us who are here 150 years from now, that's all that matters. So I want people to like, I want people from Hawaii to remember, like it's it's really good to constantly be the visionary people that are willing to bring it up, even if people are telling you that that would never happen. I see a future for Hawaii. I know, I know in my heart a liberated a liberated future for Hawaii. I think the land itself knows that. It's why it continues to grow itself. It's why it continues to build itself through like lava and the like expansion of spaces. It knows. We can't give up just because they keep telling us that somehow that's impossible since they built a lot of hotels there or whatever. I mean, okay, but to think about what we want our future to look like. Excellent, thank you so much uh, for that. Well, it is it is that time. We have to start wrapping up our conversation, but I want to say thank you so much to Karina, Laura, and Kacha. This was a wonderful discussion. Uh, this concludes uh, our series today of the Claiming Conversations. So on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for coming. As a reminder, this event was recorded. You will be able to see it on the Claiming Institute's YouTube channel soon. Thank you so much to our audience uh, for joining us and have a good evening. Take care. <laughs>